In this segment, we look at different ways in which experimental data can be analyzed. There are two broad sets of techniques, techniques used to analyze experimental data. The first one is called ANOVA, or the analysis of variance, and the second one is regression. Each technique computes a test statistic, which can then be read off as a p-value. Think about the p-value as an index that indicates the confidence that we have in the results of the experiment. In this course, we will focus on the basic ideas and leave the actual numerical computation to more advanced classes in experimental design. Let's start off by thinking about a simple experiment in which we're trying to compare the responses given by people in two conditions. One, an aggregate price framing condition, let's say $365 a day, versus a pennies a day condition in which the, the price is framed as a dollar a day. Let's also imagine that participants respond to the particular question by indicating on some scale their willingness to purchase a product in which the only thing that's different is the way in which the price is framed. Now, under each condition, you could think about the responses of different individuals as having some average x, but then a distribution around it. So for example, on a 10-point scale, maybe in the aggregate condition, the average response is 5, whereas in the pennies a day condition, let's say the average response is 6. Now at a naive level, you would say that 6 is greater than 5, and therefore, people in the pennies a day condition are more likely to purchase than people in the aggregate condition. However, Statistically, you will notice that there is a distribution around both the average of 5, which is there, and the average of 6. And so let's imagine we had a, a number, a response such as 5.5. It is possible that this number can be drawn either from the aggregate distribution or from the pennies a day distribution. So are these two means genuinely different? Every time we test a question like this in the design of experiments, the null or the default assumption is that they are not different. So we start off with the belief, with the assumption, that the two means are not different, and we use a test statistic called the t-score, which roughly is an index which computes the ratio of the difference in the means divided by the variability. The higher the t-score, the greater the likelihood that these two means are actually different. Think of a simple instance. Let's imagine we keep the two means constant. The lower the variability across the two means, think of an extreme case where there is no variability at all. Everybody in one condition says five. Everybody in the second condition says six. In this case, six is obviously greater than five. But as the distribution become more and more variable, as the distributions become wider, then chances are high that the t-score is going to reduce. And therefore, this overlap region between the two distributions is going to get higher and higher. And as a result, we will lose confidence that these means are truly different. So the t-test of differences in means provides a likelihood that the null is false or that the null hypothesis is rejected. When the t-score becomes low, essentially it would actually suggest that the two means are identical to each other and we do not have enough evidence to reject this null hypothesis. Now this analysis works really well when you have two groups, but what happens when there are multiple conditions or multiple groups? In that case, we use a technique called ANOVA. And just like a simple t-test, the null that we're going to use here is that the means of all of the groups are equal. The alternative is that the null is not true, that not all of the means are equal. Now, the ANOVA produces a test statistic which allows us to rule out the null. But if the null is ruled out, doesn't really say how they are different or which ones are different. 
To overcome that, we need to follow up with something called multiple comparisons, or as some researchers would call them, contrast tests. But if you look at the overall model, simply rejecting a null simply means that not all the means are equal, but we don't know exactly which ones and in what pattern. Now let's look carefully as to what the basic idea behind an ANOVA is. ANOVA looks at two sources of variation in the data and compares their sizes. The first variation we'll look at is between condition variations. So let's say you have an experiment where you are collecting data on people's willingness to pay or likelihood of purchasing on a 10-point scale. Okay. For this variable, what ANOVA will do is it will look at the difference between the mean of its given condition and the overall mean. For simplicity, let's imagine there are three conditions. Let's call them C1, C2, and C3. The means in each of these conditions are x1, x2, and x3. And let's say the overall mean is simply xo. So the between condition vari variation looks at the difference between x1 and xo, x2 and xo, and x3 and xo. Then there is something called a within group variation. For a within group variation, ANOVA is going to look at each condition, let's say C1, it's going to look at every single x within C1, x is the, the variable uh, or, the, or the answer that is reported by every participant, and it's going to look at the difference between that x and its mean, which is x1. So for example, let's, let's try and be a bit more formal with this. Xi in this case, it represents x1, x2, or x3. And this represents the overall x. So the between condition variation is the difference between each of x1 and xo, and x2 and xo, and x3 and xo squared. Whereas the within group variation refers to uh, the difference between the x under each condition uh, minus the average of that particular condition squared. Now here's the basic idea pushed forward. If the between group variation is large and the within group variation is small, that is evidence against the null. Basically, this ratio F says that the variation between groups, between condition one and condition two and condition three, is larger than the variation within each condition. And that is suggesting that, in fact, these groups are indeed different, or these conditions are indeed different from each other. So F represents the F statistic in ANOVA. And it's the ratio of the between group variation divided by the within group variation. Now again, keep in mind, if you only had two groups, then the F statistic reduces to the T statistic that we talked about earlier. And remember again, if the T statistic is high, that is again evidence against the null. Now, let's try and think about a second technique for using, um, you know, for doing data analysis, and that's regression. When do we use regression? Well, there are two sets of conditions under which regression is particularly useful. First, there are a very large number of variables that we expect might cause the effect. So we've got, let's say, 5 or 10 or 15 causes that we believe will result in an effect. Also, these variables don't come in neat categories or conditions. They might be continuous variables. So remember when we looked at the example of pennies a day versus aggregate, that was a very neat classification. It was either pennies a day or it was aggregate. But let's say you're studying the price or the, the dollars prepaid for a ticket, that could be a continuous variable. And different people might pay all sorts of different levels uh, of prices for a given ticket. Under those conditions, regression is perhaps the more useful data analysis technique. 
Now, what does regression actually do? In order to try and understand the logic behind regression, let's think about the relationship between one variable, x, which is the cause. In this case, let's say we are looking at the effect of the credit limit on your credit card on y, which is, let's say, the willingness to make a purchase. Now let's imagine you've actually collected some data, you've got responses from six different people where you have different levels of credit limit, which are the x's, and for each x, you know what the y is because your experimental participants actually tell you what their willingness to make a purchase is. So you have these six pieces of data. The question is, how do I now think about a regression analysis. What the regression analysis is going to do is it's going to try and find a line that best explains these data. So in this case, this dotted line best explains these data. And what does one mean by best explain? It means that the, the deviation or the error, which is represented by the distance from the line, is minimized for this particular line. So when you ask, for example, a computer program to generate a regression line, what it is doing is it is trying to find a line such that the sum of errors along the lines we just saw here uh, is minimized. Uh, and that is what is called a OLS approach to regression. So again, a regression line is a line that's, that best explains uh, the relationship between x and y. Uh, and in fact, that line can be modeled by an equation like this one, y equals to a plus b multiplied by x. Now what is a? Uh, the a represents this height, the location where the regression line actually hits the y-axis. When x is 0, what is the value of y? We often call this the intercept of the regression line. So the intercept talks about the basic value, the baseline value of y when x doesn't exist or when x equals to zero. The b represents the slope of the line. The steeper the line, for example, if it looked like that, then for every unit change in x, there would be a greater change in y. So again, the intercept represents the baseline. What is the value of x uh, of, of y when x is 0? The slope represents the rate of change, how rapidly y increases per unit change in x. Now, if in fact there are a large number of x variables, potential causes, then the same regression equation will look like this y will now look like some constant a plus b1 times x1 plus b2 times x2 plus b3 times x3 and so on and so forth till such time that you have exhausted all of your potential cause variables or your x's. Uh, a again as we said is the intercept, b is called the coefficient. Now oftentimes we do experiments in which we ask participants to report a yes-no answer. Would you choose or not choose? Would you buy or not buy? Would you choose A, B, or C? So in situations where Y is a categorical variable, it comes in categories and not a continuous scale, the analysis follows the same logic, but it is actually called a logit regression where the right-hand side of the equation gives you the probability that the, the respondent is going to choose A or B or C. So without getting into the details, the structure of the regression would still stay the same, but now rather than predicting Y, the equation would predict the likelihood that a certain outcome will happen. So that is a logit regression. So in sum, we've talked about two kinds of analysis techniques, ANOVA and regression.